Hello, everybody. This is Margaret Harris at WHO Headquarters Geneva, welcoming you to our global press conference on COVID-19 today, Monday, November 23. We have with us, as always in the room, Dr. The, the WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros, and Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director of our Emergencies Program, and Dr. Maria Van Kerkhoff, our Technical Lead for COVID-19. We will also be joined remotely by a number of people, including some special guests whom Dr. Tedros will introduce. On the line to answer your questions will be Dr. Mariangela Shimo, our Assistant Director General for Access to Medicines and Health Technologies, Dr. Bruce Aylwood, Senior Advisor to the Director General, who leads on the ACT Accelerator, and Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, our Chief Scientist. And as usual, we are translating this simultaneously in the six official UN languages plus Portuguese and Hindi. And we will be posting the Director General's remarks in an audio file of the press conference on the web as soon as possible. And transcripts will also be available later. So now, without further delay, I will hand over to Dr. Tedros to give us his, his opening remarks. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Margareta, and uh, welcome. And I would also like to use this opportunity to thank uh, Fedila, who has been uh, moderating until uh, you, uh, until today. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. With the latest positive news from vaccine trials, the light at the end of this long, dark tunnel is growing brighter. There is now real hope that vaccines, in combination with other tried and tested public health measures, will help to end the pandemic. The significance of this scientific achievement cannot be overstated. No vaccines in history have been developed as rapidly as this. The scientific community has set a new standard for vaccine development. Now, the international community must set a new standard <clears throat> for access. The urgency with which vaccines have been developed must be matched by the same urgency to distribute them fairly. Every government rightly wants to do everything it can to protect its people. But there is now a real risk that the poorest and most vulnerable people trampled will be trampled in the stamped for vaccines. That's why in April, with support from multiple partners, WHO established the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator. The ACT Accelerator has supported the fastest, most coordinated and successful global effort in history to develop vaccines, diagnostics and therapeutics. More than 50 diagnostic tests are being evaluated and new rapid antigen diagnostics are being made available for low and middle income countries. Life-saving dexamethasone treatments are being rolled out and new medicines, including monoclonal antibodies, are being tested. And 187 countries are now participating in the COVAX facility to collaborate on the procurement and rollout of vaccines, ensuring the best possible prices, volumes, and timing for all countries. Importantly, COVAX is also analyzing and supporting the systems for delivering vaccines and other COVID-19 tools, which have been mapped in four regions. And we're rolling out other tools like the WHO Academy's new augmented reality course for health workers on the correct use of personal protective equipment. However, only a fundamental change in funding and approach will realize the full promise of the ACT Accelerator. 4.3 billion US dollars is needed immediately to support the mass procurement and delivery of vaccines, tests, and treatments. A further 23.8 billion US dollars will be needed next year. This isn't charity. It is the fastest and smartest way to end the pandemic and drive the global economic recovery. 
the International Monetary Fund estimates that if medical solutions can be made available faster and more widely, it could lead to a cumulative increase in global income of almost 9 trillion US dollars by the end of 2025. The real question is not whether the world can afford to share vaccines and other tools. It's whether it can afford not to. At the G20 Leaders Summit on Saturday, it was very encouraging to hear, to hear world leaders expressing their support for WHO and their commitment to the ACT Accelerator. Thank you. In September, WHO established a facilitation council for the ACT Accelerator to leverage high-level political commitment to put the tools to defeat COVID-19 in the hands of the people who need them most. Today, we are honored to be joined by the two co-chairs of the ACT Accelerator Facilitation Council. His Excellency Daginge Ulstein, Minister of International Development of Norway, Taksomike, Takskaduhe, Takskaduha, and Dr. Zueli Mikize, Minister of Health of South Africa. Minister Daginge Ulstein, welcome, and you have the floor. Takskaduha again. Thank you so much, um, and uh, good evening, um, Dr. Tedros. By the time I have presented my speech today, many people have received a positive COVID-19 test. Others have been told that their loved ones did not make it. As of today, there are more than 55.5 million confirmed cases, more than 1 million deaths. Every second matters. This pandemic is not going away if we sit still and do nothing. Moreover, it is not going away if some countries only are taking a my nation first approach. Such vaccine nationalism is not only morally reprehensible, it is also a stupid thing to do. Because already heard many times, we are not safe until we are all safe. Our economies will continue to bleed money if countries with a large number of cases lack in obtaining the vaccine and other medicines. We are in this together and the solution is only achievable if we work as one team and yes, time is running out. This is not only a health crisis, it is an economic crisis, it is a nutrition crisis, it is a protection crisis, it is a humanitarian crisis. I could have gone on and on and on. The real world ramifications of the pandemic are all too clear to see. Every day jobs are being lost. The ILO estimates that 495 million full-time jobs will be lost in the second half of 2020. Every day people are being pushed into extreme poverty. The World Bank estimates that this could be the case for an overwhelming 150 million people. 150. Every day, children around the world are sitting at home as their schools are closed in an attempt to contain the global pandemic. This has taken 1.6 billion students out of classrooms around the globe. For millions of girls and young women, particularly those in the world's least developed countries, school shutdowns bring other risks such as domestic violence and sexual abuse. This pandemic affects us all, but it does not affect us all equally. UN Chief Antonio Guterres warns that the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic are falling disproportionately on the most vulnerable. People living in poverty, the working poor, women and children, persons with disabilities and other marginalized groups. This is easy to forget as we are all faced with COVID fatigue. So, now is not a time to feel sorry for movie time lost, parties not attended, or dinner parties postponed. We owe the most vulnerable that we do whatever we can to end this pandemic. The human costs of not acting are obvious. So are the economic consequences. We heard some of the numbers. The IMF forces $11 trillion we were lost in GDP in 2021. Behind these forecasts, 
lie businesses, jobs, local communities, families and individuals. As economies bleed money, futures are stolen, educational opportunities lost, mental health issues are rising. The sooner we get the pandemic under control, the sooner we can reopen societies and the global economy back on track. To stop the pandemic, we need to ensure that effective diagnostics, therapeutic drugs and vaccines are not only developed. To stop the pandemic, we need to ensure these tools are distributed to people around the world. If we are to succeed in this, we need to engage with civil societies, humanitarian organizations and private sector. And yes, there is hope. We have tests that provide results in less than 30 minutes now. We have better knowledge of how to, to treat the disease. We have a wide portfolio of vaccine candidates on the cusp of finalizing, finalizing phase three trials. We need to make sure that we do not end up with having these tools, but not the infrastructure to make them available to all. Fortunately, there is a clear path forward, and that is the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, Act A. This initiative was set up to promote equitable global coverage of vaccines, tests and treatments, and strengthen the health systems. In just six months, ACT Accelerator partners have compiled the world's largest portfolio of these tools. To continue rolling out rapid testing, evaluating new treatments, and ensuring access to vaccines as soon as they are li licensed, the ACT Accelerator urgently needs 4.3 billion and a further uh, 23.9 billion in 2021. So we have a problem, we have a solution. Now we only need to make it work. I would argue that this is a no brainer for the world leaders. $23.9 billion sounds a lot, yet the total need is less than one tenth of one percentage point of global GDP. In other words, if G20 countries were to devote just 1% of their current stimulus spending on efforts to alleviate the economic consequences of the pandemic globally, they would actually have more than cover the needs of the ACT Accelerator. I would argue that this is a small price to pay to getting the world back on track. Once full travel and trade are restored, that investment would be repaid in as little as 36 hours, 36 hours. I think we all know that the cost of inaction far outweighs the cost of action. So this is the best business case ever, and it is the only way. There is no plan B. So each dollar, pound, euro, yen, and yen spent on the accelerator is underwriting future demands for goods and services so that global trade and growth can bounce back. In a letter sent last week from South Africa, Norway, the European Commission and WHO, we called on the G20 countries to consider support to the global COVID-19 response as part of their domestic stimulus spending and to contribute substantial amounts to fully fund the ACT Accelerator. And as the G20 summit in Saudi Arabia closes, I think we can say that we are being heard. The 20 biggest economies vote to spare no effort to supply COVID-19 drugs, tests and vaccines to all people. Yes, we still have a long way to go and the pledging marathon will continue. However, I think the recent news about coronavirus vaccines and the strong support from the G20 meeting addressing the need for solidarity and multilateral cooperation makes me truly believe that we can allow optimism fuel our next steps. Yet, only a fundamental change in funding an approach will turn new hope of technological achievements into an effective weapon against the virus and allow us to change the course of the pandemic. I trust that every world leader see that this problem is not solvable if we don't collaborate. The cost of inaction and the human consequences of prolonging this pandemic should be incentive enough. So to end, it's amazing what we have actually achieved so far. Despite many ongoing conflicts in the world, despite difficult topics, all countries are somehow united in this. 
Yes, when it comes to the ACT Accelerator, we are actually sitting, still sitting around the same table. Yet we come to the table with different perspectives and different needs. But so far, everyone has been willing to listen, to stretch, to try to understand and meet each other, because we understand how closely interwind our countries and people actually are. The ultimate goal becomes so much more important than just launching the best and right solution for ourselves. So with that said, back to, to you, Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Ulstein, for your support and commitment. And as you said, I fully agree, the best case ever, and it has to be supported. Thank you so much again. It's now my great honor to introduce Dr. Zueli Mikize, Minister of Health of South Africa. Your Excellency, welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you, thank you so much for your support also. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the WHO and all the members of the WHO team, my colleague, the co-chairperson, uh, Minister Doug Inge Olstein. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this very special occasion, this briefing. If there was ever a case for solidarity and global cooperation, this COVID pandemic has demonstrated one. <clears throat> the crisis is hitting the world hard and our most fragile regions harder, affecting income, health, education, and other parts of our socioeconomic lives. COVID-19 does not respect national boundaries and as long as it exists anywhere, it is a threat everywhere. No one is safe until everyone is safe. Global solidarity isn't just the right thing to do. It's the smartest thing to do, ensuring that tools are allocated equitably, not based on income, <clears throat> but based on universal protection against COVID-19 is the fastest and most effective way to defeat the pandemic and get our lives uh, and our economy is back to normal again. We must treat access to COVID-19 tools as a global public health initiative. Collective efforts to stamp out the virus now would also mean that future deadlier strains or mutations that are more difficult to treat could be avoided. It is clear that every country will need to play a part in financing an end to this crisis, and every leader has a political choice to make. But the lack of adequate financing for our global exit strategy, the X Accelerator, is an existential threat to the economic and health security of, of all countries and their, and their citizens. Speaking on, uh, uh, from, the, from the perspective of uh, uh, the African continent, <clears throat> it has now recorded over 2 million cases with 49,000 deaths, uh, which, uh, which is accounting for 2.5% of the global caseload. There are early signs of resurgence as 18 countries, which is 38%, more than 20% increase are recorded in numbers the last seven days when compared to the previous seven days. It's also not certain how a resurgence on the African continent will evolve and therefore early equal access to vaccines and therapeutics will be critical in mitigating the threat posed by the resurgence on the continent. As part of these preparations, President Ramaphosa, His Excellency, uh, Chair of the African Union, established a COVID-19 Afri <coughs> African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team uh, to lead this effort. In addition <clears throat> to equitable access to COVID-19 tools, we also need to pay attention to the strengthening of health systems. The X Accelerator offers a clear way forward for ending the crisis through global cooperation that will deliver uh, all countries uh, to need, uh, need to end the acute phase of the pandemic, restoring economic vitality and, av and uh, averting catastrophe. And whilst the pace of scientific research and development into effective vaccine therapeutics and diagnostics is unprecedented, its true value will only be realized if countries can access these tools and are prepared for their use. Every country has to work, has work to do to ensure that once ready, these tools can be rapidly deployed. This includes ensuring that capacities 
and infrastructure that need to be radically scaled or upgraded to deploy COVID-19 tools are ready and working. Bottlenecks in key areas of health systems such as data, workforce, clinical care, supply chains, as well as access to key commodities, uh, sorry, key commodities such as PPEs, oxygen, remain limiting factors to effective deployment and use of COVID-19 tools in many countries. The health system connector pillar of the ACT Accelerator is the critical mechanism to support countries to bolster and strengthen through a tailored approach that uses global knowledge to address local problems. Countries' readiness is an absolute prerequisite to the equitable scale up of the COVID-19 tools. It is a hurdle we must clear if we are to win this race. And this is one time where we all need each other and every country matters and therefore we need to make sure that we focus on more and more partnership, solidarity and global cooperation. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros, for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Mikide, uh, for your support and commitment. And I look forward to working with both of you in this very critical period to realize the promise of the ACT Accelerator. Thank you so much uh, again, and I hope you will uh, stay with us for a few more minutes to answer uh, if we have questions from, from the media. And with that, uh, back to you, Margaret. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. So yes, we will now open the floor to questions. I think I probably don't need to remind you, you need to use the raise your hand icon to get in the queue. We already have a large number of you in the queue. So I ask that you restrict yourselves to one question. Remember, we also have uh, our experts on the line and in the room. Uh, so you know, indicate clearly uh, what, what your question is. And we have limited time, so please keep your question short. Uh, so I will stop talking now and give you a chance to ask your question. The first one goes to Corinne from Bloomberg. Corinne, could you unmute yourself and please ask your question? Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, it'd be great to get your take on the AstraZeneca vaccine results, especially since it said that they're going to uh, try to get a quick recommendation from the WHO. Um, and it seems like the results are not that straightforward. So I, that question, I think, will go to Dr. Sumia Swaminathan. Sum, Dr. Sumia, are you on the line? Yes, yes, I am, Margaret. And and thank you for that question. Um, uh, first of all, I'm sure the person who asked the question, like all of us, is very encouraged by the news that we got today. Um, the preliminary results that have been released from the clinical trial of the AstraZeneca vaccine, following on the encouraging results from the two earlier vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna, both of which are mRNA vaccines, the AstraZeneca vaccine being a viral vector vaccine. So I think the good news is that vaccines for COVID-19 disease is possible to make, and it's possible that we will have a number of different vaccine candidates that can be used in the fight against this disease. And as we are discussing the ACT Accelerator today, I think this is very relevant because we would like to, to provide access to as many efficacious and safe vaccines as possible so we can cover the population around the world. Remember, we have to cover a huge number of people, billions and billions of people. This is unprecedented. And we will need all the manufacturing capacity in the world to be able to do that. Now, on the AstraZeneca results itself, we've heard only the preliminary results um, about the vaccine trials that were done in the UK and Brazil, um, looking at two slightly different do dosing schedules. Um, and, and the schedule that, that had the two doses of the same, uh, the same dose given two times had a slightly lower efficacy, but, but still it was about 62%, which is above the the benchmark that we had set. Um, but the, the schedule which gave uh, a smaller dose followed by a larger dose, actually, the efficacy seems to have been higher, up to 90%. But again, this is based on rather small numbers. And I think we need to wait.
to see the results, both of the efficacy and the safety. The AstraZeneca vaccine is also being currently trialed in many other countries. And eventually, we should have data on about 60,000 patients or so that will enable us really to have a much more informed decision. So we await discussions with the company, and, uh, and they're already talking with our pre-qualification program uh, on, um, on how they would go about. Uh, and, and Dr. Simao is uh, available to answer more questions on that. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Swaminathan. And over to Dr. Simao for some added points. Thank you very much, Margaret, and thank you, Corinne, for the question. Actually, we, we have had already several discussions with the AstraZeneca on a, uh, following the expression of interest that WHO issued for the emergency use listing and pre-qualification of the vaccines. So we are very hopeful. We are about to receive more data that includes uh, clinical data in the next week. And we, uh, we, uh, we are also aware that AstraZeneca has, is also submitting the dossiers to the European Medicines Agency, and we do have a very close collaboration. There are actually eight sites, that, uh, and some of them are manufacturing sites. So we will be analyzing this data with, uh, very carefully, uh, but very much welcome the results so far. We expect that we should have a... a uh, f f finalize the, the assessments in the beginning of next year. Thank you. If I could just add, Margaret, I forgot to mention the advantage of this vaccine is that it can be stored in the ordinary refrigerated temperatures of, of two to eight degrees and is stable at that temperature. And that, of course, has huge logistical advantages for transporting and delivering this vaccine to cities and towns and villages uh, and rural areas around the world. And we hope there will be m more vaccines like that, which are more heat stable. And, uh, and we have to uh, also uh, continue to encourage all the other developers who are doing clinical trials and who are in early phases of, of development, because we do need a variety of vaccines out there that will target different groups better, that will have different uh, storage conditions. And also uh, the issue of affordability is, is also important to keep in mind. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Swaminathan and Dr. Shimal. Uh, there do, do not seem to be any comments in the room. So I will take the next question uh, from Gunilla, the Geneva correspondent for Swedish media. Gunilla, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, please go ahead. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, it is very, very promising with the vaccines coming, vaccine candidates. But first, we have Christmas, and Christmas is now about one month away. Uh, and countries start to give advice. Like in the UK, they said that we can have, we can have an exception of three households celebrating Christmas together, which could be a lot of people. In Sweden, meanwhile, the prime minister yesterday said there should be one family staying inside for the time being. So I'm wondering, uh, would you be able to give advice, recommendations, how countries should deal with celebrations around Christmas, especially in Europe that now are still in a very high, still have a very high community transmission? Thanks. I can start, Maria will follow up. I, I think, first of all, it's important here that we separate the, uh, the science of um, um, COVID-19 from what is the policies uh, that surround uh, that science, uh, because governments have to make choices, um, and they have to decide on the local epidemiology of the disease. They have to decide what the tolerance level of the population has been, how long people have been in lockdown or not in lockdown, what level of control they have, <clears throat> how strong their public health architecture has become uh, over the last number of weeks. Have they expanded their capacity to test, to trace, to quarantine, and to isolate those people who are actually sick or carrying the virus? Uh, are they able to protect vulnerable populations? So the decisions to uh, ease restrictions coming towards a holiday period, and there are many countries uh, heading towards holiday periods we've seen the most recent uh, holiday period in Canada, there or their Thanksgiving, they did see an increase in transmission after that period because people come together, they mix, they travel. It's inevitable that in the presence 
of community transmission that if you further release the opportunity for the virus, it will find opportunities to transmit. But there is the trade-off, the economic and social trade-off in that. So I think it's really important that we're not trying to bend science in this. The science is straightforward. If there is significant community transmission in your country and you don't have the necessary public health architecture to track and trace and isolate and quarantine contacts, then further opening up will result in increased transmission. There's no question of that. <clears throat> the question is, <clears throat> have you got the disease under enough control to start with? And can you, uh, in a sense, allow people a little bit more freedom over the period of the Christmas period, which generates uh, a sense of confidence and a sense of joy in the community, which people need right now, without letting the virus let rip again within our communities? And this is a, a very important trade-off. Uh, and it's a trade-off between those two issues. Please, the science is clear. The policy is what's not clear. And each government will have to decide on its policy based on those trade-offs between the epidemiologic risk versus the economic and social risk of continuing to have people in a restricted situation over a holiday period, which will generate genuinely a lot of frustration, further fatigue, uh, and, 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 and uh, a lot of pushback. So, uh, Maria may comment on the technical aspects of this, but I, I certainly hope that we're not going to enter into a period where we're trying to come up with a formula that says this is how much you can open up and this is, you know, how many days of Christmas we can have by some scientific formula that says this is safe and this is not safe. There is no safe or unsafe decision. There is only higher and lower risk of the situation getting better or worse depending on what you do. Thanks, Mike. Yes. I mean, I think the point is, is that there's, there's no zero risk here right now. We are in the middle of a, of a pandemic, and many countries, unfortunately, are in a very difficult situation with increasing case numbers, with hospitals full, and with ICUs full. So, um, as Mike has said, there's lower risk or higher risk, but there is a risk. This virus needs us. They need people to spread between. Um, and if we allow it to, we could be that individual that brings that virus into someone's home. What we have outlined to support countries in making those policies is a risk-based approach in terms of what is the situation in the areas where you live, where people need to travel from, where they need to travel to, um, and you as individuals need to take decisions about how will I celebrate these holidays that are coming up, that have happened. Um, am I going to be visiting a family that has vulnerable individuals that live in that family? And what is the possibility that I could potentially bring that virus into that home where someone who lives there has a higher risk of developing severe disease and a higher risk of dying? So there's a lot of things that we, we, let, we outline. You know, who will you be visiting? What will that situation look like? Um, can you have that holiday indoors or outdoors? How crowded will it be? You know, there are ways in which you can reduce the risk, um, but there is no zero risk, unfortunately, in this situation. Um, I do think I agree with Mike and, and, and all of you who understand that this is incredibly difficult because especially during holidays, especially during birthdays, especially during these family celebrations, we really want to be with family. Um, but in some situations, the difficult decision not to have that family gathering is the safest bet. So everyone will need to take that decision uh, based on your current situation, based on your family, uh, based on where you need to travel. Um, we hope everyone will have a, a, a happy holidays um, and find ways to connect. So, unfortunately, unfor many people around the world have access to ability to connect virtually. Um, and I think that that may be the way that many areas need to go. But I do want to say that even if you can't celebrate together this year, you can find ways to celebrate when this is all over. We are doing that within our own family. And we are going to have one heck of a celebration when this is all over, regardless of when that is. Um, and that is something that helps, I personally, myself and my family, uh, get through because we know that eventually we will be able to celebrate with our loved ones. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. Uh, the next question goes to Nina Larson of AFP. Nina, could you unmute yourself and please go ahead? Uh, yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, Nina, please go ahead. Thank you for taking my question. Um, 
I understand that um, you've held a briefing for diplomats on the progress on the independent international investigation into the origins of COVID-19, and that um, some concerns were raised about the lack of transparency in negotiating the terms of reference for the mission, uh, and also over the amount of time it's taking to send a team to China. I was hoping you could provide us with um, more information on the terms of the agreement with Beijing, and uh, also say when you expect them to go to China, and it would be good to know who's on the list or how many people are on the list. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. I can start, and maybe Mike would like to supplement. So um, we have actually released the terms of reference for the uh, mission online. We have also released the names of those who are on the international mission online. Um, and so that is, is completely transparent um, for you to see. Um, as you know, uh, we sent a pre-team uh, of, of WHO staff to um, China over the summer to discuss with counterparts the nature in which the studies um, that needed to take place. Uh, we've outlined phase one and phase two studies. It's all in the terms of reference and you can see that. Um, where these initial studies, these phase one studies, need to take place uh, in Wuhan, looking at the earliest cases that were reported and identified in Wuhan, looking at these epidemiologic studies that were done, and there's a number of studies that are uh, underway that need to be conducted by Chinese counterparts. The international team has met uh, and is meeting with Chinese counterparts to see how that could be supported um, through a global collaborations. And, and this is very technical and very science oriented and very research oriented because there are many, many studies that need to, to be undertaken. Uh, the international team will travel to China. Uh, that is being discussed amongst the international team and the Chinese counterparts. Um, and that will be arranged um, in due time. Think that's working at all now is it on yeah okay okay um just to add uh, certainly with regard to uh, <clears throat> the mission briefings and remember we have um, <clears throat> weekly briefings with our member states at mission briefings and we're engaged in in very open and transparent dialogue with our member states every single week and we discuss every issue from vaccines to the act accelerator last week to the to the animal human origin studies uh, all the way through to surveillance, to contact tracing. We have the member states presenting on their own case studies, on their own experience. We exchange that information, and the DG has led from the front in engaging directly with our member states on a weekly basis on all matters of importance. Uh, on the issues of the progress with the, uh, with the animal studies, in fact, quite the opposite. The member states who spoke, uh, and there were no, and, uh, many, all expressed appreciation for the, the progress that was being made. Uh, for the terms of reference uh, uh, and asked for, <clears throat> obviously, for further progress to be made in the phase one and two. We explained uh, to our member states the content of the phase one studies uh, and, and, the, and the hopes for phase two. Uh, one member state did express some concerns regarding the phase one studies and ensuring that they were completed as quickly as possible. We reassured that member state that the, that, the, that would happen. Uh, and again, we did uh, release to the member states the names of the international team members. Again, the international team has been brought together. We were in the process of finalizing uh, their, their uh, legal documentation to be members of this group. And as soon as we had been able to confirm all of that, we uh, put the, the names of the team up on the list. There are also, and I, I must also express the team themselves, the international team, have expressed their own concerns. Uh, there has been a level of attack and abuse to people involved in international science. It is not an easy p uh, space to be in right now, and let me be plain about that. We have all received our fair share of hate mail uh, and threats and everything else right through, uh, through this process. And it is important that we as an organization protect the space of science and protect those scientists. And we would like to thank them for their openness and transparency and for allowing us to, to release their names. That's not an easy choice when you're trying to do your best for your own system and for the international system. So we thank them not only for their scientific leadership, but for their courage in doing that. And it's a strange thing to have to say in this world today that it takes courage to be a scientist. I, I, I used to think it only took brains, but now you need to be brave and courageous as well to do science in the face of the um, the the anti-science movements that we see. 
uh, and the ideologic politics that has come into this process. Uh, we're very, very pleased with the reaction of our member states. We're particularly encouraged by the way in which uh, so many countries are supporting everything that we're trying to do. Imperfectly, as we do it, our member states recognize the massive effort that this Secretariat is making with our collaborating centres and scientific partners to fight this pandemic. And uh, we look forward to making progress on the, on the animal uh, human origins studies and again uh, look forward and again I have made it very clear at that, br that briefing that we are pushing for cooperation from all countries and especially from our colleagues in China who have identified a very strong Chinese scientific team and we are working very closely with that. We expect openness and transparency from all our member states when it comes to scientific collaboration and we trust we will continue to receive that from our scientific colleagues in China. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan and Dr. Van Kerkhoff. Uh, so the next question will go to uh, Michael uh, from CNN. Michael, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Um, as a kind of follow-up to the last question, um, it's hard to believe, but we're almost at a year where case zero or the index case for coronavirus um, was kind of identified. However, all we seem to know, according to state documents reported on by the South China Morning Post, is that it was a 55-year-old uh, male, but uh, he can't be identified or no one can trace him. How important is it in your investigation to find the origins of the coronavirus, who uh, case zero was or who the index case was? And just quickly, also the wet market where the virus is believed to be originated, um, that's been cleaned up and closed off. How will that imped, imped, how will that be an impediment to your investigation? Thank you. We could uh, end up in a lot of detail. Your, 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 your questions are, are, are well asked. Uh, identifying case zero is a very important aspect of all epidemic investigations. There may be more than one case zero in, in some situations because there may be more than one species breach. We're increasingly seeing that SARS-CoV-like viruses have been identified in many different countries. Uh, in fact, in horseshoe bats most recently in the last few days, we've seen other potential intermediate hosts identified in various settings. So there's no question that this virus has a, a natural home probably somewhere in the, in the bat community, some intermediate hosts who we haven't fully uh, identified yet. And how that disease then breach that barrier into the human uh, species may have been a single event, it may have been multiple events, those events may have occurred in one particular time or over a range of different times. Because if the virus is present in the animal kingdom or in wild animals, then the chances of multiple introductions, and we've seen that, for example, if you look at the recent animal or human to animal or human to mink and mink to human, we've seen multiple reintroductions into the human population uh, from the mink population. It wasn't just one uh, exposure back. So the, the, the natural history of these things is at least one case zero, probably more. Uh, the DG has always said, and was very, very strong on this from the very beginning, that we need to start where we found the first cases, and that is in Wuhan and China, and then we need to follow the evidence after that, wherever that that leads. Um, and uh, with regard to the, the Wuhan seafood market, in fact, one of the interesting findings is while there was most certainly a temporal and geographic cluster associated with the market, not all of the cases in that initial cluster can be linked directly to the market. So the market is likely to have been a point of amplification as we've seen, uh, for example, in the Shanghai and the, the event in Beijing, we had a uh, uh, Shanghai, um, a, a similar event. So we, we're, we, we don't know whether it was a, a human that drove the amplification event at the Wuhan market, or was it an animal? Was it an environmental contamination? We don't, we don't, we don't know that. Uh, but certainly it's clear that there were cases that preceded that event at the Wuhan market. So the real question is, the original species barrier, where did that occur? Um, and uh, that is still unknown. And it's extremely important, and the, the terms of reference 
for the for the investigations clearly lay out in the phase one the, the necessary epidemiologic and clinical and serologic and retrospective studies that need to be done to establish whether or not there's any evidence trail that will lead back. It is remarkably difficult. It is like looking for a needle in a haystack sometimes for an individual event to look for that single event. We've, I've been doing that in Ebola for the last 25 years and we've never hit the mark. We've never really, except in one occasion where we could actually identify the actual event where the disease crossed uh, the species barrier. So this is not easy to achieve. Uh, so we will um, uh, pursue uh, those investigations uh, over the next couple of months in phase one and hopefully move on uh, to phase two. So. Uh, I think, Maria, there was a second part, uh, if you want to come in on the, the markets, yeah, I think it's important. So yes, so as Mike has said, there's a lot of, there are a lot of studies that, are, that need to be underway to find the initial uh, cases, um, wherever they may be, and, and, and look at the conditions by, in which they were infected. So this case zero that you mentioned uh, may not be, in fact, case zero. There could have been other cases that existed that weren't detected because they weren't picked up through current surveillance system. That's not a criticism. That's just a possible fact that we need to look back. We need to look retrospectively to see what happened. Um, the amplification event at the market in Wuhan um, certainly is what triggered more transmission and the conditions by which that happened um, is, the, is, the, is the focus of some study as well, looking at the animals that were there, um, that were sourced at that market, um, where those animals came from, where those animals were onward sold, um, looking at environmental samples that were collected there, and there were a number of environmental samples that were collected in that initial market um, from animals, but also from surfaces around different parts of the market. Um, and those results uh, the Chinese um, colleagues have presented to the international team. Um, and so there are some results from there. But all of these are um, clues, if you will, that help lead to the next question. As, as far as any answers that we get from any studies, they lead to a number of additional studies. And so as Mike has just said, and as the DG has outlined, we follow the science. Um, we're also working with, with a, a large number of people across the world looking at retrospective analyses in, in different countries. Look, you've, you've heard studies of wastewater, um, studies that have looked at samples from 2019. We're working with our, our Ciro Epi networks of looking at stored clinical samples and Ciro from 2019 to see if any of those test positive. But all of these really help us to piece together um, how, how this unfolds. Um, just to point out that for MERS coronavirus, it took us almost a year to find the intermediate host for the MERS coronavirus, which is the dromedary camel, the one humped camels. And those came from detailed epidemiologic investigations at the animal-human interface with people who were caring for camels, testing the animals, testing the camels, looking at sequences, and being able to match and see that there was transmission that had happened between the humans and the camels. And it does take time. Um, and we know everyone is really anxious to get these answers, and those studies are underway. Um, we need the science to unfold. We need those studies to be done carefully um, and thoughtfully and thoroughly. Um, and we will be there um, across the world with our international partners to support that every step of the way. And Margaret, can I just add, to be clear again on the, the, the journalist's question, we, we fully expect uh, that we will have a team on the ground. We need to be able to have the international team join our Chinese colleagues and go to the ground and look at the results and the outcomes of those phase one studies and verify these data on the ground. This is extremely important and, uh, and, and we are continuing to expect that that be the case and we would like to have that team deployed as soon as possible. So we're building the relationship between the Chinese counterparts and the international team. We have regular uh, Zoom calls between the two groups, and we fully expect and, 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 and have reassurances from our Chinese uh, government colleagues that uh, a trip to the field, a uh, field uh, <clears throat> part of the mission, uh, will be facilitated and, and as soon as possible in order that uh, the international uh, community uh, can be reassured of the quality of the science. Uh, and, and again, the Chinese colleagues have done a tremendous amount of scientific investigation. In fact, I think have published uh, hundreds and hundreds of papers regarding the situation in China and the learnings they have done. But clearly, we all need to understand the origin uh, of the virus. We all need to understand where it has come from, not least to understand where it may re-emerge in the future. So, uh, and I believe uh, our, our, our Chinese colleagues are just as anxious to find those answers as we are. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan and Dr. Van Kerkhoff. The next question goes to Emilio de Medito from El Pais. Emilio, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello. Perdona. Up. Hello. Good afternoon. Good yes. afternoon. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yes, there you are. Yes. Uh, I'm going to make a very short question, but is it really? I, we've heard Dr. Fidros and, and Mr. Wurstein talking about how important it is to, to make sure that the poor countries are going to receive their share of the new developments. And I'm thinking about the vaccines. And I, I don't know how, I want to ask them how realistic it is to think that they are going to receive them on time, or are they going to be the last ones in the queue? I'm thinking now that we are knowing the plans for in Spain and in in Germany and all other countries, the plans that they have to vaccinate their own people, where they have to put to establish to prioritize mm -hmm. amongst the population. So I don't know if it's realistic to think that these countries are going to give part of the vaccine. So how are you going to do it to make sure that the poor ones are going to receive their share? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I, our ministers, our guests would like to, to uh, respond to that question. Thank you so much and um, thank you for that question. And I think this is uh, the most important thing because it's not enough to develop vaccines. It's all about the last lap. And that is why my colleague from South Africa and I have been so um, uh, clear on, on our mission also. It's about creating uh, equitable access for all and to make sure that uh, vulnerable groups and, and critical health workers in all countries. So um, and I know this is very much um, uh, on, on Dr. Tedros' um, uh, heart and mind also because we really need to make sure that the logistics, that the infrastructure, that we have um, uh, shared knowledge and, and trained enough uh, healthcare workers in all countries to make sure that it's possible actually to roll out um, and, and, and to use those tests and to make sure that the medicine will be available and, and that we make sure that the infrastructure for the vaccines uh, are in place. So it will not be easy. It will be really, really difficult. And that's why I, I'm so clear that we need to, to first make sure that the finance gap, not only the urgent gap of, of, of 2020, but we make sure that we will um, mobilize as much money as possible, also for the gap for 2021 right now, because this will not be easy. It will be really, really difficult. So we need to make sure that we use the momentum. Um, uh, and so I, I, that that's, uh, will not be easy, but we will do whatever it takes to make sure that we will have fair and equitable access to all. So that's why we also wrote the letter to the G20 countries. Um, and I really hope we'll have some su substantial um, um, uh, answers uh, with, with, with new fresh money also uh, into the portfolio. So, so, so again, but over to, to, to my colleague. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister. I think we all agree that uh, the approach has to be that of equitable access and the issue has to be that, uh, you know, uh, there should be no one left behind in each country that requires uh, to be assisted, does need to be assisted. And on that basis, we believe that uh, some of the discussions on the COVID facility uh, will take us to a point where there is a way of being able to assist those who can fund themselves to get the basis that we need to start and then that uh, support also get assisted as well. So the, the general message that we all sending across is the message that basically says that we, we need to you know focus on the uh, you know for everyone needs to be safe on the basis of having some access to a vaccine and then of course as in the the more vulnerable would need to be targeted first so that uh, with time as the volume start to increase, we're able to reach out to more, uh, you know, uh, 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 members of society right across. But it would be quite risky to have one side uh, that is covered uh, because it can afford, and then some uh, uh, other member states not covered simply because they cannot afford. Was that still creates a risk of the resurgence of the uh, uh, pandemic? So our approach is more or less the same. Yeah, I think uh, uh, ministers have uh, said it uh, 
very well, uh, maybe to stress. One, uh, I, I think there are three important issues here. One is the political commitment. And second is the political commitment to share. And second is the financing. And third is preparing the infrastructure of uh, countries. So on the political commitment and financing, as um, uh, Minister said, uh, we have brought it to the attention of the G20 and hopefully others outside the G20 uh, will also uh, support. They will give their political support and also we hope they will give uh, financial support. It won't be easy, it's going to be tough, but at the same time we have now the facilitation council and the facilitation council which is chaired by uh, Norway and South Africa, its objective is to make sure that uh, the political commitment and also the uh, financing is uh, insured. And on the third, the um, uh, preparing infrastructure, um, the World Bank, UNICEF, WHO, Global Fund, have already uh, sent a letter to our country offices to work with countries to prepare uh, the uh, infrastructure for vaccination, uh, to identify gaps and uh, fix and uh, prepare it. That will uh, include uh, training of uh, health workers and so on. So. Um, uh, all agencies relevant for this are also working on uh, preparing uh, the countries, and that's very important, the preparation of uh, countries. Um, one country which we have seen actually very, really advanced is Ecuador in terms of preparing uh, for uh, vaccination. I had uh, the opportunity to speak to the health minister and the uh, foreign minister last week, and they have a very good model. Uh, learning, I think, uh, uh, identifying best practices of countries and sharing it with countries to use w will be uh, very uh, important. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tedros and honorable ministers. Uh, so we're really coming up to the hour, but we're going to take one last question from Morocco. Uh, and that is from Abdullah Hussan from Morocco News. Uh, Abdullah, could you unmute yourself and go ahead? I think you may be asking in Arabic. Assalamu alaikum. Shukran uh, lakum ala ikhtiyar hala sual. Wa katali. Ma mada faaliyat liqahat alati sofa ta'atamid dua al-maghrib fi al-hamla wa tqiyam al-talqih. Alati sofa tuandimu wa qariban ka awal dawla Afriqiya. كمان علم أن هناك ثلاث لقاحات متقدمة سينوفارم سبوتيك فايف وفايزر شكرا لكم شكرا I think the question is about vaccines but alaikum salam to you um, I think Sumia can come in. You asked the question whether the vaccines are effective. I think three of the vaccines have clearly demonstrated efficacy in the trials so far. That data is being put forward to, to various uh, regulatory authorities uh, over the, the last, uh, over this week and next week and probably in the, the coming weeks. And certainly uh, that data we hope will also be provided directly to WHO so WHO can make decisions about uh, emergency uh, use and uh, uh, and uh, emergency use listings uh, and other things. The, the question you have regarding providing a vaccine to Africa, I think that is really what the COVAX initiative is about, ensuring that uh, uh, an initiative that covers 80% of the world's population and the vast majority of the population of Africa. I don't know if Bruce is online or uh, if he is, then Bruce can speak to just how many countries in Africa are actually signed up to the COVAX initiative, which actually I think covers the vast majority of countries on the continent. Bruce? Dr. Elwood, ah, there you are, go ahead. Yeah, hey Mike, um, and, and, and greetings all. Now, I think it's been covered already. The majority of uh, countries on the African continent are signed up to the, uh, to the COVAX facility. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually over 45 countries now on the African continent that have actually joined. And, the remainder are still considering, and, and there's issues, uh, fiduciary and others that need to be considered. Uh, but uh, clearly, people see this as 
the key, as Minister Olsen and Minister Mkwesi said, uh, the COVAX facility is key to the equitable allocation of vaccine globally and to ensuring that um, uh, all countries get some product rather than some countries all product. Uh, this is absolutely crucial to getting the world out of the economic, societal and health crises that it's in today. And to the question, the specific question that was asked, yes, it is absolutely possible to see an equitable allocation. This is a function, as Minister Oldstein and Minister Mukwesi said, of political choices with respect to financing and to the timing and use of products. But increasingly, there is very, very clear recognition globally that this is uh, the best possible way out of this crisis. And I compliment. Yes, please go ahead. And it's just so to say that we, as we heard before when the question came about AstraZeneca, it's very important that we have different vaccines, different platforms being developed. Because some of them, like the, the Pfizer vaccine, needs a ultra coaching, which brings logistic problems that are not only uh, challenges for. Uh, countries in Africa, there are challenges for all low and middle income countries and for some of the high income countries as well. So we see the portfolio of uh, uh, including other vaccines beyond uh, the mRNA vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna as a very good uh, point ahead in ensuring that there will be access to all countries as the, the, the platforms are more uh, easier to use at country level. So that's the, in a nutshell, how we are seeing it. It's very important to ensure uh, equitable access, and but we need to take into account also the characteristics of each vaccine and the the, the coaching requirements uh, that will be make make it uh, the availability at country level are more more challenging. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shumal. And I believe, I'd like to give, ask the Minister for Health from South Africa, Dr. McKenzie, if he would like to add something. Yes, thank you very much. I think following on the response that has been given, the, just to bring to the attention of the uh, person who asked the question, that from the African Union perspective, there's been a task team that's been set to help to coordinate the uh, access to vaccine together with the member states, also working together with the COVAX facility, the Gavi and the, and the other partners. And in this process, the center, the African Center for Disease Control is the one that's at the center coordinating, looking at the numbers, the needs and so on. So that uh, in addition to whatever the WHO and all the other players are doing, uh, there is uh, adequate support from the uh, African uh, uh, Union member states. This is building on the work that was done during the difficult days of the early COVID pandemic, where uh, the, the assistance, the support, the donations, the needs, the new uh, you know, tools for acquisition had to be coordinated through the Africa CDC. So they have actually engaged a number of uh, manufacturers and they've engaged COVID just to be able to understand so that uh, Everything is aligned, and I think the key issue is also to say we need to look beyond the point of uh, the COVID uh, um, uh, process and in terms of how, what else needs to be done to reach out to the largest numbers of people who still, do, still need to be assisted. So there's quite a bit of work that's being done at that level, and certainly we don't, we don't believe that the African continent, the member states, will actually be left behind. So there is lots of work being done at that level. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister. Uh, and thank you very much to all journalists who joined. Your questions were excellent today. We really appreciate it. Uh, we have to finish here now, but I'll hand over to Dr. Tedros for a few more words. Yeah, thank you. I think they always ask excellent questions. <laughs> this Wednesday marks the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Around the world, nearly one in three women have experienced physical or sexual violence, mostly by intimate partners. As countries have implemented stay-at-home orders and other measures to prevent transmission of COVID-19, 
reports from women experiencing violence at home have increased. At the same time, services for survivors have been disrupted. Violence against women is never acceptable. We're calling on governments to include services for women affected by violence in every country's package of essential health services and to allocate the resources to make them accessible. We're calling on health providers to pay more attention to identifying women who experience violence and provide first-line support. And we're calling on everyone to show their solidarity with women affected by violence by raising their voices and by wearing something orange this Wednesday after tomorrow as a symbol of solidarity and hope. Thank you and see you on Friday. And I would like again to thank Minister Mikize and Minister Ulstein for joining today and also for your leadership of the Facilitation Council of the ACT Accelerator. Thank you, Norway. Thank you, South Africa.